you have your Bibles, I want you to get it out. I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians, then to Proverbs, then to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be all over the place today, but we're going to be talking about something that's so needed. It's difficult to preach. It's probably even more difficult to hear. But we're in a series called Beautiful. Turn to your neighbor and say you're beautiful. Can you do that? Come on. Turn back and say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. How many people, not to embarrass you, but I want to see your hands if you were not here last week as we kicked off this series. Raise your hand high so we can get on the same page. Not to embarrass you, but raise them really, really high. No, um, don't do that. Um, we started this, this series with this premise, and I believe it to be true, and if you think about it, it makes all kinds of sense. We live in a world that leads with ugly. Everything is ugly. Watch the news. The first 28 minutes of a newscast is ugly. Everything is ugly. Um, we're not encouragers. We, we, we'd rather rip people apart. We, everything in life seems to be leading with ugly. There's very few things that are beautiful. So last week, my friend, Robert Tino, who was here, saw Robert paint. I mean, crazy good stuff. Actually, um, I, I don't know which one he painted. Um, I forget which one. He painted five different originals for last week's um, message. There are no copies. You can't buy a print, any of that. Why? Because God made you original. You, you, there's no copies of you. There's no prints of you. You're an original. You're God's masterpiece. So he painted um, to really illustrate that Robert makes a living um, be, because we yearn for beauty. We love to look at beautiful things because we live in a world that ugly is all over the place. It's easy to equate beauty and ugliness physically, but we don't think about it spiritually, that a lot of us are spiritually ugly and we struggle and we wonder why we feel the way we do. We try to live up to someone else's standards in life and we feel insignificant and incomplete and there's all, all stuff to say about that. And I, I want you to watch last week's message if you didn't. But we started with a key verse of scripture that I ask you to memorize. I don't know if you did or not. I would love for you to do that. Ephesians 2.10. I want you to think about this verse of scripture because this is where we, we're going to start. This is where we're going to end. This is the key verse for the entire six-week series, for we are God's masterpiece. Turn to your neighbor and say, yes, you were God's work of art. Do that. You realize God loves you. He made you. You are original. We are God's masterpiece. But this is what I'm after. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. So if you have blown it in your life, that's yesterday. Can't do anything about the past, but you can do something about today. You are God's masterpiece. You might think you're ugly, but God thinks you're beautiful. He created you anew in Christ Jesus. That's a relationship that we don't deserve, but we can be made brand new. We can be what? Transformed, not just informed. You just heard that song. That song's powerful to me because my goal in life is not for you to be informed with some message. It's for you to be transformed because that makes the difference. So we can do the good things. Can you say good things? Good Come on, say it like you mean it. Say good things good that he planned for us long ago. Can we do it on our own? No, but we have been made new in Jesus Christ. I love that verse of scripture. So last week, I gave us three prayers. Here's what we got to do. In order to really let go of some things in our lives, let go of what I call our ugliness, we have to acknowledge that we are ugly. Turn to your neighbor and say, acknowledge it. You're ugly. Can you do that? But you're like, Brent, you confused me because I just said I was beautiful. And then I was, it, you, you get the idea. There's three prayers that we got to pray in order to let go of our ugly. And we're going to weave these prayers into this whole series. Each week, we're going to hit one or multiple of these prayers. Um, so here we go. Ready? God, help me. We need this every day in our lives. Help me renew my mind with truth. Say the word renew. You get the theme. What does Romans 12, 2 say? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be renewed, right? Be transformed in our minds with the truth. God, help me restore what's lost. And then we're going to get to it toward the end. God, help me release my offender. We're going to talk about anger and unforgiveness. Yes! Love it. Get your emails ready. Sure, I'm going to get some good ones. Three prayers. I believe we need to be praying every day if we want to acknowledge our ugly and we want to let go of some things. Renew, restore, release. 
Today I'm going to talk about a word that's in, in my wheelhouse. It's a word that I deal with, the word I think about a lot. It's something that is very important to me. It's very personal to me. And I want you to listen to this word. I want you to own and understand what's going on. And I want us to think about beautiful and I want to think about ugly. And the word is integrity. Integrity is a beautiful thing. But the lack of integrity is ugly. Husbands and wives, if your husband has integrity, wives, it's beautiful, right? But what about if your husband does not have integrity? What if you catch him looking at things he shouldn't be looking at? It's pretty ugly. In our world today, integrity is beautiful because we live in a culture that's more shocked when people have integrity than when they don't have integrity, even in the church. I used to think about even athletes in my mind that were beautiful. I used to love watching Tiger Woods. I, I'm, I'll admit it, I was a Tiger Woods fan until I found out that he was, a, I mean, no integrity. And you realize that did him in, right? Lance Armstrong. I live, I, 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 before I wore Pathways bands, I had a Live Strong band. Who wore Live Strong? I mean, I mean, Lance Armstrong, come on, man. He won the Tour de France like 98 times. Like, how do you do that? Well, we found out he had no integrity and he was ugly. He became the butt of people's jokes. Robert Petraeus, a general. Hey, we look, at, we look at men and women in the military of integrity until we find out that he had no integrity. And man, let me tell you, your life can be destroyed. You guys, I mean, I wasn't quite old enough. Some of you are old enough, but you remember a guy that we used to think was beautiful. He ran incredible. He had such great character. He made great, he knew what to say. Who was it? OJ, right? Integrity is a beautiful thing, but it's the lack of integrity is ugly. And you better be paying attention. Start with a story, true story. I love this story. This is an incredible story. It illustrates this point incredibly well. True story happened in California. So not here, it's fearful. Um, there was a man who uh, he and his girlfriend were going on a picnic one day. They were deciding to take their convertible up into the mountains and do a little, uh, little picnicking. And so they stopped by their favorite chicken sandwich shop, not Chick-fil-A. Went into this little mom and pop shop, this little diners, drive-ins, and dives. They got their favorite chicken sandwiches. They put it in their picnic basket. They drove 30 minutes to their favorite picnic spot. We'll call it the point. They got their, their, their you know, everything laid out, their blanket out. They've got their grapes and their cheeses because no picnic is complete without grapes and cheeses. And they opened up their sandwiches and their brown bags. And he opened up the first sandwich bag and he got a chicken sandwich. So, but he opened up the second bag, true story. And he got $800 in cash. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> to which he put the $800 back in the brown bag. They got all of their stuff together. They drove 30 minutes back out of their way, back to the little sandwich shop. He walked in the door and said, I ordered two chicken sandwiches, and instead I got $800 cash in a brown bag, and I just want to return this because this isn't mine. Amen. That is beautiful. So I've done it all, every service. We'll do it this one. We'll see how many liars we have among us. Go ahead and you don't have to even close your eyes. How many of you would have done that? You would have driven 30 minutes out of the way and taken that money back. Would you raise your hand high? <laughs> so many liars in the room. It's unbelievable. <laughs> who wouldn't? Who would just be honest to say, you know what? No, I'm 30 minutes away. They gave it to me. Manna from heaven. Raise your hand high. <laughs> how old are you? How old are you? How old are you? How old are you? 12. 12. See, the 12-year-old's honest. <laughs> the rest of us are... The rest of us, I know what we would be. We would be manna from heaven, baby. I mean, I know what we would do. What do you think the manager did? He literally threw a party. The manager started to cry. I mean, this is a little mom and pop shop. $800 is huge. What happened? The girl that was bagging the sandwiches gave him a chicken sandwich, and there was a brown bag that was going to the bank for deposits, and she accidentally gave the deposits of the day to the man instead of the chicken sandwich. But he drove 30 minutes back out of his way and gave the money back. 
That's, that's, that's beautiful. To which the manager's now crying. He wants to take photos, get the iPhone. We're going to Instagram it, Facebook it, Snapchat it, tweet it, whatever. We're going to do it all. To which the man goes, I would rather you not do that. Please just don't even know that I'm here. I just wanted to give the money back. And the manager's like, what's the problem? And the man confessed, you see, my girlfriend, she's not my wife. And I... <laughs> that just turned ugly really quick, didn't it? <laughs> Some of you are like, what? I mean, right? I mean, integrity is beautiful. The lack of integrity... Is ugly. I'm going to put this over here now. Um, Becky Webb, my assistant's watching this money. In okay, case some of you come up after church and go, oh man, I'm from heaven, right? I'm going to talk about the word integrity, and it means a lot to me. Um, I live my life in a fishbowl. Most of you know that. I really can't go anywhere without people seeing me and see what I do. And um, yesterday I was at the golf course hitting range balls, and I, had, um, I just had uh, my headphones in, and I was hitting a bucket of balls, and I think I had uh, Bon Jovi on. I was, I'm a, you know, that wanted dead or alive song. I'm a cowboy on a steel, you know, and two guys walk up to me and, preacher? I'm like, hey, how you doing? And they proceeded to talk to me for 30 minutes about the church and everything good, and um, I, that's just kind of how I live my life. I've signed up for that. I, I get that, that, you know what, integrity means a lot to me. And it really means a lot to me since I was 17 years old. Really, since I was 20 years old, when I had a mentor, I had a college professor mentor that I thought was beautiful. Um, he spent two years pouring into my life, telling me things, very specific things of Brent, how to guard your heart and what not to do and be careful that Satan would trap you here and do this. And I would find out later that he would fall and he would lose his integrity and he would lose his ministry. And it really, really, really affected me. Integrity is beautiful, but the lack of integrity is really <laughs> ugly. So I want to give you the definition, integrity. If you go to the dictionary, it's going to say this. What is integrity? Some people are like, well, I don't even know what integrity means. That's a sign of the times, right? Um, trustworthy, keeping your word or being true. So if you are 20 years old and down, I want you to stand up. I need to talk to you for a minute. If you're 20 years old and down, I want you to stand up in this room. Stand up, guys. Come on. Stand up. 20 years old and down. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. First off, look at all the hair. Look at all the hair. It's amazing. <laughs> Just love it. Love it. Guy last night had hair like that tall. He was, he was flinging it around. Y'all look at my hair. I spent three hours on my hair today. It took a lot of time. Okay, seriously, I want you, I want you, I want you, to, so, I want you to look at me real quick. You guys are going to think I'm old. I get it. I'm, I'm pretty hip, though, 40, 47. If you get this word right, your life as you know it will be beautiful. In your relationships, business life, influence, all those things, you're like, what? If you get this right, even in school, your life will be beautiful. People will look at you differently. If you get it wrong, you'll be like everybody else, and they won't really care what you say. You get it right your life will be beautiful. If you get it wrong in your relationships, you get it wrong in your world of business, you get it wrong, I'm telling you, there is an aftermath that you don't know. Our world says do whatever you want to do, especially in the privacy of your own home. Do whatever you want to do. Watch whatever you want to watch as long as it's not hurting anyone else. Look at me real quick. And now I'm going to go old school. I had a professor in college. His name was Dr. Thompson. He was boring. Old man winter. Y'all think I'm boring? I mean, come on. I'm super exciting compared to Dr. Thompson, who was, okay, class, turn into your book. <laughs> and I would fall asleep. And when I was awake, I learned a lot in his class. And he would say this. And I want you, everybody sitting can listen, but you guys standing, I need you to listen to me. I was 20 years old. I had Dr. Thompson for Theology 1 and Theology 2 in Bible. Old, older than Hills. He's probably dead now. I'm pretty sure. He, he was way old. And that was 1990, a long time ago. And he would start every class or end every class with these words. And this is what I remember. He would look at me and he would look at the class and he would penetrate us in the eyes and he would say, young men, and there were some ladies, young ladies, if you have integrity in your life, that is all that really matters. 
But if you do not have integrity in your life, you will find out that's all that really matters. You either have it or you don't. You're either striving for it or you're not. What's it going to be? Now, see everybody else seated? A lot of them have screwed up their lives. They understand what I'm about to roll into here. There's been aftermath. There's been issues. There's been collateral damage. There's been a lot of destruction in relationships. There's a lot of regret in the choices that they've made. You guys, guess what? You get the opportunity to live a life of integrity. And I promise you it's worth it. You got me? Okay, you can, you can be seated. All right, so my definitions. Now that you guys are 20 and down, you're like, man, he scared me to death. I want you to write my definitions down. Ready? When your behavior matches your belief, that's integrity. When you actually believe something and you live as if you believe it, that's integrity. See, I believe this. I don't think integrity is doing the right thing. You'll never have integrity in your life if you're like, just inside you, I'm just going to try to do the right thing. Integrity is believing in the right person. That's Jesus Christ, trusting that Jesus Christ has saved you and set you free and set all things new in your life, and you're going to surrender your life to him. That's when you live the right way. Because you cannot pull greatness out of you. I don't care what Tony Robbins book you read. It's really Jesus Christ in you. If not, the world will wash over you like a wave. I promise you. You think you have integrity, but you do the things in your private life. If it were exposed into public life, some of you are like, well, I don't care what I do. I feel good with it. All right, then stand up in front of a church setting in front of God and tell what you did last Friday night and see how good you feel about that then. Tell your children what you think of and what you watch and what you do. See how good you feel about that then. Some of you ladies in this room, stuff that you do and you think about and you fantasize about, you know what? And you think, well, that's just me. That's fine. Good. See if you want to put that on your daughters. See if you want them to live the same way you live. This message gets hard, right? This is like old school hard. But man, this is in my wheelhouse because I know, trust me, I'm not stupid. I know that Satan would love to rip me apart and for me to, to, to fall and lose integrity and everything that I worked for for 20 years, trust and respect that you guys look at me and say, Brent, you're not like the perfect preacher, but you seem to be the real deal. You seem to be an honest guy. If You know what? It can be gone in one moment in my life. But you don't get it, do you? You are the greatest ministers of this church. You will reach people I will never reach. And look at me real quick, and I'm going to say this with all kinds of love and harshness. If you don't live a life of integrity, the stuff that you put on Facebook, the stuff that, you know what, you, you know that that's not, you are conforming to the patterns of this world. Shh, shut up that you're a Christian. Don't tell anybody that you're a follower of Jesus Christ because you're pushing people so far away from Jesus. It's not funny. And eternity is a long time. When you live your life, and you know what? Your lifestyle is just like everyone else in the world. Why would anybody care what you have to say about Jesus? When your behavior matches your beliefs, when what you say lines up with what you do, all the 20-year-old and down will be looking at mom and dad right now going, yeah, preacher, preach it, baby. Because mama likes to say this, but she sure don't do it. Hey, I'm a parent. I know the deal. Things are more caught than taught. You could say what you want to, but my kids are smart enough. Well, you don't do that. Oh, this message is so, I get to preach this five times this week, y'all. This is like a proctology exam for me. This is amazing. <laughs> what you do when nobody's looking. I'm not taught, integrity is not your reputation. Your reputation is who people think you are. We're great at that in the South. <gasps> Look at us. We get out of the car, church. Praise Jesus. I am free today. I get it. Integrity is who you are when no one's looking. That is who you are. Dr. Thompson, the same guy that taught me for two years in theology, he would say this, young men in, in the ministry, if you don't want to fall into Satan's traps, make sure you realize the video camera is on you 24 hours a day. And he's like, I'm not talking about people in your congregation looking at you. I'm talking about God looking into you because God sees 
what you're doing, even in the privacy of your own home, if you really believe that Jesus is the answer, you really want to walk in the way of Christ, you want to walk in the way of trust, then you've got to live it, what you do when no one's looking. You see, you're like, well, Brent, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know about all this. Well, let's look at Proverbs 11.3. Proverbs was been, written by who? Some of you are like, I wasn't expecting to be interactive today. <laughs> Proverbs was written by who? Solomon. King Solomon, who was known as the wisest man ever to live. Now, his lifestyle later in life did not back it up, but he was known at one time to be the wisest man. Listen to what he says, and this is wisdom. 20 year old and down. Put this in your life. This is a life verse for me. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. You can put any person in that equation, from Tiger Woods to Lance Armstrong to teachers and politicians and preachers to marriages that fall apart. You could put anything to that equation if you are trying to live a consistent, honest life. There are no perfect people allowed. You're not going to get it right every single day. But if you're like, listen, wait a minute. It's not about me. It's Christ that lives in me. The integrity of the upright can guide us, and we can avoid traps that people can be destroyed and are destroyed by every single day. What does the Bible say? A double-minded person. You are unstable in all of your ways. You might be okay in this season. We'll see about the next. 1 Thessalonians, I want to peek over the Apostle Paul's shoulder for a minute. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church of Thessalonica, a church that's trying to get it right. Hopefully that can be said about us. And I want to peek over the Apostle Paul's shoulder for an all-time moment. Because in Thessalonians, Paul is writing this very positive letter, trying to encourage this church. And I really believe this is God encouraging us today. And listen to what it says. Pay attention to the words, because this is what it's all about. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Do you realize? Look at me. The church, those of, uh, who's, who's a follower of Jesus Christ? You're a Christian. Raise your hand. I want to see it. I. You realize the church is plan A. There is no plan B. We are to bring the good news. It's approved by God. This message is approved by God. I'm God and I approve this message. Come on, y'all. That's good. <laughs> Our purpose, this is huge. We kind of forget this, right? Is to please God, not people. Say it with me. Please, God. not people. Like you mean it. Please, God. not people. Okay, so I got to confess, the preacher's screws up from time to time too. Wednesday night, I was preaching this message, and I was preaching it to our Greensboro partner church, Grove. I was thundering away at this moment, locking in on this verse. I'm going to say something that I've said in this church for years, and I believe it in my ministry, that I would rather tick you off than God off any day. I've said it multiple times. How many people have heard me say that before? Okay. Well, I was thundering away. Has anybody ever thought one thing and said another? I mean, I'm literally thundering away at this moment. I'm trying to like ingrain into Grove. Hey guys, get this point across. And I actually use this word, quote, I am unapologetic about this. I would rather tick God off than you off any day. That's what I said. <laughs> I said that. So I had to shoot a video last night, and I said, Grove, listen, I would rather tick you off than God off. You get it. Most people get No one corrected me. They just kept on like, what is wrong with him? That's not right. <laughs> people pleaser, sell out. You know, I mean, I can see it. <laughs> our purpose in life is to please God, not people. Why? Because he alone examines the motives of our heart. I don't know the motive of your heart. You don't know the motive of my heart. We can head fake each other all day long. Get out of the car, look pretty, do all that good stuff, sing songs, act right. But we don't know the motives of our heart. Remember, God alone examines the motives of our heart. If you really want to live a life of integrity, it's all about that relationship with God. You yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God what? That we were devout and honest and thoughtless toward all of you believers, Apostle Paul Tolkien. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. That's a great statement. We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you. That is, that is my entire goal here. I'm pleading with you. 
20 years old and down, I want to encourage you and I want to urge you, what, ready? Listen, to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. So write this down. Um, And it keeps going for, he called you to share in his kingdom, his glory. Write this down. A life that is consistent and honest is integrity. That's all I want said about me at the end end of my days. I don't care if you think I'm a good preacher. The best of preaching is foolishness if God's not in it. But I want you to say, you know what? I knew Brent off the platform. I knew him on the platform. I want my wife and I want my children to say, you know what? Dad was consistent. He's pretty honest. He wasn't perfect. He, he had his moments for sure. But you know what? What you saw in him is kind of what you got. When I'm home alone, when no one is with me, I know that God is watching. And it's, it's interesting to me. I think about this verse of Scripture a lot. It's interesting to me that, you know, um, if you don't watch it, you can put a lot of pressure on yourself. And you think, oh, man, i got to live this life. And especially for me, a preacher, um, i got to live this life. And listen to what Psalm 15, 1 through 5 says. This is a really interesting verse of Scripture. And this is what you got to think about it. Ready? Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? What does that say? God, who can hang with you? Hey, God, who can hang with you? And here's what the psalmist says. The one whose walk is blameless. Is anybody in this room, your walk is blameless? Let me see your hands really high. Okay, so we're out, right? Check, please. I mean, that starts right away. Who does what is righteous? Who speaks the truth from their heart? Whose tongue utters no slander? Skip, you're out. I mean, there you go. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gone, right? <laughs> who, who does no wrong to a neighbor? Blew it? There you go, buddy. I mean, who... Who casts no slur on others? Richard, you're out you're second row. Who despises a vile person, but honors the, those who fear the Lord? Who keeps an oath even when it hurts? Can any, you're like, what, what? Well, I guess we're all out. We might as well just, whatever. Who does not change their mind? My son will be like, Dad, you are out. <laughs> Who lends money to the poor without interest? I can't even charge 9%. who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Integrity is not doing the right thing. It's believing in the right person. It's believing in the greatness of God who sent Jesus Christ that you and I might have a life that we don't deserve. And if we keep our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, right? If we look to him and trust in him and die to ourselves and live in Christ and look to Christ and say, wow, you know what? I can't walk this road on my own. I can't do this on my own. I have to trust Christ. That's when it all happens. And there are benefits of a life of integrity. I promise you that you want. Write them down. Number one, you can walk closely with God. I believe in it. I know it to be true. I believe when you accept Christ, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have a relationship with God through Christ. But also, you can have an intimacy and a fellowship with God that some of you don't quite understand. You feel like God is way distant from you. Why? Because you're not walking closely with God. You're not living a life of integrity. You're not living with a single purpose. You are allowing the culture to wash over you so much, you're living a life of duplicity. You come to the church and hear the truth. Why? Because the truth will attract you. But yet, the culture preaches so loud that this is what you're supposed to do that you follow the culture as well that's a double-minded person you're unstable and God will remain distant if you try to deal with this on your own and you don't constantly daily surrender your life to God is God and you're not case in point how do I illustrate this my 14 year old son my perpetual sermon illustration Mason just does so many stupid things it's like a pastor's dream The other night, he got home from football. He's practicing with the high school team now at his school that he goes to, and he was tired, and he's lifting weights, and he's whiny. And I'm like, Mason, you have any homework? No. Yeah. I got a test tomorrow. I'm like, do you know it? Yeah. I'm like, give me the vocab paper. He handed me the vocab paper, and I just started down with the first word. The first word was skeptical. He didn't know what, did not know what that meant. So 
I say, Mason, I will put this into a sentence for you. I am skeptical that you will not get a good grade on this test <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I mean, I went down this. I spent time. I was tired. He didn't know it. I had to sit there and poke and prod for an hour. I beat these vocab words up in his mind. I got him up early the next day. He was super excited about that. Yeah. Sat in the school parking lot, went over these words, and he got a 98. I don't even know how you get a 98, but he got a 98. On vocab words, you either, you know, anyway, he got, he got an A. He was pumped. He called me after school. I could feel it in his voice. It's like, Dad, woo, got an A on that. Because he was, I was trying to tell him you weren't going to do good on it. And I'm like, dude, I, I got your back. I'm, I'm helping you here. Why are you getting upset with me? I want you to succeed more than you want to succeed. I got your back. I'm more proud of you than anything. But you know what? I'm really proud of you when you listen to me. You're 14 years old. You know nothing about nothing. <laughs> Parents, can I get an amen? amen. Listen to me. He listened. He surrendered. He submitted his will to my will. He got an A. He called me up, and it was like an over-the-phone fist bump. I could, hear, I could hear the pride in his voice because he knew I would be proud of him. And he's like, Dad, I got an A on that. And almost, I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing out of his mouth. Thanks for helping me stop. I'm like, who is this boy on the other end of the phone? I don't know who this is. But you could, feel, you could sense that I got home. We didn't have to say anything. We fist bumped, and he could feel my pride. I'm like, dude, that's what it's all about. I'm so excited and proud of you. Do you realize that's my relationship with God and your relationship with God? God has got your back more than anybody else. He wants you to succeed. But you know what? He is God, and you are not. Quit complaining all the time that you know better than God knows. That's good preaching, y'all. That's worth an extra 40 in the offering for candy. That's, that's good. You'll have a built-in guide. Kind of already talked about that. Number three, you'll have peace in your heart. Don't you love it that you can go to bed at night? I sure do. When I say, you know what, God, today's been a great day. I can put my head on my pillow and think, oh, I'm sure glad. So, I'm so thankful somebody didn't see me do what I did today. I'm so thankful that nobody saw me do that. And so thankful that nobody... You never hear the opposite, do you? God, I'm so thankful nobody saw me read my Bible at lunch today. I'm so thankful nobody saw me help that person fix, fix their tire. I'm so thankful no one saw me witness to someone or encourage someone. It's always, I'm so thankful what I did in the darkness won't be exposed in the light. You can have peace. Do you realize that's what everybody's looking, everybody in the world is looking for, peace. That's all we ever hear. We need peace, peace. Heal the world, make it a better place. I don't even know why I came to a Michael Jackson song there. That was weird. Um, you can gain trust and respect and honor and influence. I'm learning this in my life. You know what? Just to try to live the life, you gain trust and respect and honor and influence. He's probably not here. He'll probably be at the service tonight. I'm picking on him hard. He's going to remain nameless. He goes to our church. He's a young man that I've uh, I picked on pretty hard. He's taken it pretty well because he kind of walked off the, the he kind of walked off the church train this summer. He got into too many other things, and life provided too many other opportunities. I got on him pretty hard. And I said, dude, listen, I got so much hope in you. God can use you in such great ways. But you're not even going to have trust and respect and honor and influence with your own kids, much less me or anybody else, especially the way you've been living your life. I love you as a friend enough to tell you. People that know you, love you, if you have integrity, you earn the right to talk to them about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, you will face a Christless eternity. That's what the Bible says. That's not my words. You can believe what you want to believe, but if you don't believe that what I'm saying is true, you better be real convicted and convinced that what you believe is true. Because if you don't believe what I'm saying is true, eternity is a long time for you to be wrong. 
How's it working for you? If you don't have a life of integrity, nobody's going to listen to you. No one will care. I promise you that. They won't. They'll be like, you're like everybody else. What does it matter? Hypocrisy is the opposite of integrity. Hypocrisy, a Greek word, an actor to play a role, to play a game, to head fake everybody. Who cares if you can head fake me and I can head fake you? What does that matter? Doesn't the Bible say to please God, not people? Some of us need to hear that. I mean, the question I'm really going to get down to is what is your integrity worth? Is lying on a resume to get a job worth it? Well, Brent, everybody does that. To lie on your taxes, is, is it worth it? I told that story a long time ago. Years ago, I was a young man. First came up in ministry. I was a youth pastor in my dad's church. An elder on the board of the church was a tax guy and did my taxes. He came to Javon and I and said, the church didn't take out enough taxes. This is with my first full-time job in ministry 20 years ago. And said, Brent, you're going to have to owe. Look, look, at, look, at, look at this now. The elder on the church board doing my taxes. Here's what he said. You're going to have to owe $2,000 on your taxes this year. Now, do you keep a, a log for mileage? I'm like, 20 years? I know. I didn't know you were supposed to do that. You drive around for church all the time. He goes, why don't you go home and create one? Just pick a, pick a log up and just make sure this number gets into the bottom line. Give it to me. And then I'll put this number into your taxes and you'll get $200 back instead of paying $2,000. And the elder on the church board telling a pastoral staff member to lie. I said, No. And we ended up, we didn't, I mean, I don't even know how we got the money. We ended up, Javon and I ended up paying $2,000. But I'm the same guy at that time who was like, Mr. Boy Scout, Skip, you were around. You even had hair back in the day. <laughs> the same guy that would stand up as an assistant pastor. And I would tell you, hey, guys, time to take out your tithes and offerings. Let's trust God with our giving. And I was the guy that gave nothing. Because we had too much credit card debt and we had to have this car and we, we, we had to finance that jacuzzi and, and we had nothing. I mean, we had, I mean, we literally made this and we, you know, that, that went out. I mean, we were crazy. And so I'm like Mr. Boy Scout. And I, and I know Bob. I mean, he's still around. I know Bob, the, the tax guy, the elder. He was one of the guys that counted the money. I mean, I was convicted for years because here I told him, Bob, I'm not going to lie. I can't believe you do that. And I know for sure that he knew I didn't give a dollar in church. So the first part of the story, you're like, Brent, that's beautiful, man. That's why I love you as my pastor. Second part of the story, Brent, you're butt ugly, dude. I can't believe you would do that. What's it worth to you? Husbands and wives, hey wives, is it worth, is your integrity worth this, that you've had this discussion about money and y'all, y'all, your money's tight right now and you're like, we can't buy anything right now unless we both agree and you go to Belk or wherever you shop and there's that sale and Satan's tempting you and you over, you're overcome with temptation and you buy that outfit and you think to yourself, I'm going to tuck it away. You let it sit on the shelf for two months, you pull it out, you put it on, your husband goes, What? I thought we talked about this. We can't buy anything. You're like, this is not new, honey. I bought this months ago. This has been sitting on the shelf. So you basically gave up integrity. Just a piece at a time. Just a piece at a time. Cheating on tests, students. See, I'll close with this. I went to a secular university for two years to get my associate's degree and get all my general education out of the way before I moved to Indiana and went to Indiana Wesleyan University to get my, my ministerial degree. And the, for, for the first two years, Skip, you went to St. PJC, right? I'm picking on Skip Day. Um, first two years, it was a big university. I mean, it was like a re- arena seating for, for classes. 300 students in like sci- the science class sitting in this huge arena. An old professor would come in. He could accuse been there for a hundred years. He could care less. All the tests were Scantron, multiple choice. He would throw the test on his desk. He would say, y'all come up and get your test. You got one hour. I'm going to eat lunch. When we get back, I'll collect them. 
And so what would happen is everyone in this arena would spot the smart people. <laughs> and we were like, okay, you're smart. You girl, you look really smart, okay? Um, and all of a sudden, they would like just really rib her until she would say, one, C, two, D. You literally had to put both fingers in your ears not to cheat. And he would come in and goes, I don't know how y'all did it. All three of them, all 300 of you got a 97. Congratulations. I mean, it's <laughs> just cheated. I mean, so I'm like, okay, I left Florida. I left Heathenville. I left the secular university. There's a reason I'm going to a Christian environment. So you can imagine my disillusionment when I sat in the back of all my ministerial classes and I watched Bible guys cheat on their test in college. Rampant. I played intramural sports. I played um, intramural flag football and basketball. I thought I was a good basketball player until I went to play in Indiana intramural leagues and got killed. Those boys are serious in Indiana about basketball. And it was, I mean, I know I was already married. I got married between my sophomore and junior year of college. So Javon and I lived off site. We lived in our own dorm. But I was a part of the fellows and a part of the guys. And you can imagine my disillusionment when my ministerial friends would talk to me about having sex with their girlfriends. But Brent, you can't relate. You don't understand. You're already married. You can imagine my disillusionment that half of them never even were a part of a local church for the two years that I was there. They never went to church. And they were going to be pastors of a church. And they gave me lame reasons. Javon and I would be pulling into our apartment. They would be coming down the dormitory at like 1230 right after church on Sunday. And they would be like, oh, uh, yeah, the hot water was all taken. All the, it got cold, so we waited till noon so the, we had more hot water so we could take a shower. And that's why we had to skip church today. And so I would make fun of them like crazy. I looked at one guy in particular for two years. I looked at him all the time and I said, you know what I'm praying? He's like, what are you praying for? I'm praying that your church people will be as committed to your church as you're committed to church right now. You're going to have nobody there because you surely don't care. He goes, well, it's going to be different then. No, it's not. Integrity is integrity. You build it every day and you can lose it like that. You're like, that's a lot of pressure. Not when you just follow Jesus. Understand the greatness. Understand it's about being transformed day after day. It's about being redeemed. It's about being reborn. It's about being renewed. Jesus died on a cross for me and for you that we can have a right relationship with God. I promise you, integrity is worth a lot. We live in a world that's really ugly. Integrity is really beautiful. God, I come before you as we close this service. I'm just going to ask with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm just going to ask you this question. And this is a confessional moment here. You're like, Brent, I got a lot out of today. I needed this message today in my life. It's so easy to walk down that wrong path. And I don't want to be destroyed by my duplicity, but I want to I want to surrender my life. I want to make sure that I'm allowing God to guide me. And this message today really, really, really penetrated my heart. I needed to hear it. I need to hear the truth. If that is you, I want you to raise your hand with heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to raise them, raise them up and keep them up for a second. Wow. You can put your hands down. Thanks. A lot of you. God, I, I am so grateful to get a chance to preach this message. I know it's hard. It's very hard to speak. It's hard to listen to, but it's so needed in our lives. What would happen if one or two or three of us decided, you know what, we're going to live more consistent today, more honest today. We're just going to surrender our lives to Christ more today than yesterday. Yesterday ended last night. We can't do anything about yesterday, but we can do something about today. Are we going to live a life of integrity? Integrity is beautiful, and it's so needed. It gives us a chance to speak the truth and let the truth set people free, and the truth is found in Jesus Christ. I'm grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, amen. Would you stand up? Sing this chorus. Don't leave real quick. Just sing this chorus again. Let's learn this. Just sing it again with Scott. Sing it, Scott. I've been transformed. Come on. I've been redeemed by the precious blood that fell on Calvary. Sing it, come on. I've been reborn. I like that song. I've been made new by the mercy, grace, and love I found in you. 
Let's build it again. Come on, I've been transformed. Come on. I've been transformed. I've been redeemed by the precious blood that fell on Calvary. I've been reborn, I've been made new by the mercy, grace, and love I found in you. I've been transformed, I've been set free. All God's people said, 